<laughs> I like just sat down. Yes, yes. Oh, you just sat down. Gosh. I said, hey, it was 8 o'clock. You know how I am. I am a person who likes to be on time. Did you it's fix your electronics? No. Uh, so, yeah, I like to be on time. I just think it's a respectful thing when you're doing something. I've always been that way. I feel like sh being on time is a way just to respect other people's time. And uh, I know you were running around doing things. And sure. She literally sat down as the process of sitting down was happening. I was hitting the let's do this button. So glad you're here. Thank you so much for being here, hanging out with us on this wonderful Wednesday evening. How cool is that? So, yeah, today don't have a big t giant subject to talk about, but we will, in fact, have a giveaway. That's a true story. Now, you can see these things. How right random there? is this? So That's one, really two, random. three. I wanted it to be the random giveaway tonight. And it is. Don't All you really agree? useful and awesome. All of it's awesome. All of it's useful. And I think whoever wins these things, are you're probably uh, hopefully going to enjoy it. <laughs> but often we have a theme. And I'm like, you know what? Way too many times we've had a theme. In fact, we've always had a theme. And tonight... We're no going theme? themeless. <laughs> no theme. It's a themeless giveaway. Hmm. So that's the dealio there. Uh, so, yeah, glad you're here hanging out. So I don't know what the deal is with you with weather. And I know a lot of you have been dealing with hot weather for like all summer. You're like, oh, welcome to the welcome to the 90s and 100s. But today it got to be pretty close to 100 degrees here in the Chicagoland area. And Toasty. that is the first time this summer where I thought, wow, it's hot. Yeah, you've had a very mild summer in, in our area. All summer, like we pretty, pretty much, much right? have, yeah. And then today, it was close to 100. Tomorrow, it's supposed to be close to 100. And then Friday, it's going to be in the 80s. And then Saturday, down and high in the mid 70s. How cool is that? So, if you wanted a weather report of the Chicagoland <laughs> area, wow, there that you go. is why I am here. So, if all I need is the green screen, and I could do the whole United States, I've been practicing. Uh, so that's the story there. It's been really warm. So, that's what's happening there. And then. The land of videos, what's been going on is the this past Sunday, we actually finally got to do a video together, and we did the centerpiece fish for a 75-gallon aquarium. So if you've got one, we picked four that I like in a 75-gallon. All four are fish that we have kept in a 75-gallon as that centerpiece kind of focal point for... We, we've done it many times and for many years, and it worked out pretty well for us. And so that was Sunday. Uh, you care to tell the class what happened today? Oh. For the small skate video? I got behind on my editing and I didn't want to rush it. And so I think it's just, I'm just going to say that it's going to be out Saturday. That's what you're going to say, huh? Yeah. So you yeah. have to wait. I don't want to say, oh, it might be tomorrow. The next, and then, no, I'm just going to say it's going to be a Saturday morning video because who doesn't love a Saturday morning video? I do. I don't love a Saturday morning video. No, no I'm kidding. Then you don't I, have to watch I it. I actually really enjoy Napoleon. Saturday morning videos because you hmm. wake up and. You yeah. just, you know, click the YouTube thing while you're eating breakfast, and next thing you know, you've got your favorite YouTube content creators just talking about whatever you want to listen to. Listen to. You got so, it. So, yeah, that's that. And then uh, the members video will be out tomorrow. I know last week I said it would be out Thursday. It wound up going out on Friday because things got super busy with all the in-service days we had for school uh, last week. But I will try to get back on track and make sure our members videos are going out on Thursdays like they're supposed to. I kind of failed at my job. I'm sorry about that. And then... Let's see here. Sunday, we'll have a video out on Primetime Aquatics. I haven't decided which one that's going to be just yet, but I hopefully it will be worth your time. That is always my goal. So that's what's going on. Uh, places we're going to be, well, let's see. We have Saturday the 2nd. We've got the Greenwater Aquarius Society swap. So that's coming up. And then two weeks after that on the Sunday, which will be the 17th, I believe, that is the GCCA that's the first swap of the GCCA season. So that's what's going to be going on there. So I'm excited about that. And then the weekend after that, which I believe is like the, it's the Friday, Saturday. So whatever that is, like the 20th ish, 22nd, 23rd, 21st, somewhere in there. It's the Friday and Saturday is the Keystone Clash. And so I'm totally looking September. forward to checking that out for the first time in my whole life. So hopefully you can be there for <laughs> one of those things and it will be pretty cool. So that's, the videos that's where we've been and where we've been at uh 
Second floor, thank you so much for being here. Got some moderators in the house. Hey, Shannon, Thanks for hey, Ryan. hanging out with us. Amy, thank you so much for becoming a prime timer, prime mate, prime time partner. Yes, you are all of those things when you join the crew. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you being here. That's pretty awesome. And to everyone else, hello, good evening, and good night. So glad you're here. So I'm, I'm just getting a lot of hot weather going all around the United States, in Texas, and in Georgia. Yeah. And see, I told you, people were going to be confused by your shirt. Astros. Astros. It actually well, is a fantastically cool shirt. I mean, there really is, is a specific reason actually why I am wearing this shirt today. Really? Because it's hot out. Because it was almost exactly very close to last year that oh we were God. at the, the Dallas Aquashella, and we went to um, Galveston and a whole bunch of places where mm -hmm. I got this sweet shirt, yeah. and it was hot as well. So. That's what made me think to wear the shirt. That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, great guppies. No, it is the second. So unless they change it, in which case then we're not going because let me just see here if they... Green water? Yeah. I mean, if they change it, then we're going to be skipping that one because we have that weekend booked and it was on their thing. Um, oh, this is so annoying. Hold on a second here. Green water... Now you got me wondering. Sorry, Purple. I got to call Purple. a timeout here and see if they did something to our schedule. Is oh. this new? What is going on here? Yeah, you see that? No. It was right. It's right there in the big letters. Swap meet and meeting events. Oh, Saturday. then we're going to be gone. Yeah, we will not be there that Saturday the ninth because we've got mm. other things going on. So it got switched from the second to the ninth because mm. it's been the second. It was that Labor Day weekend forever. So yeah, they probably realized that, and they were like, "Oops!" Or yeah, number of vendors backed yep. out. So okay, yeah, that'll be. Well, never mind. We won't be at the Green Water Swap. So I just we just Summer. found that out live that that is not going to be happening in September. So thank Breaking you. By news. the way, Bob, thanks for uh, making that known because I've said the second now forever because that's what it was, and I we we planned something for that weekend on the ninth specifically to get around the Green Water and the GCCA swaps, and then they uh, they changed it. So breaking news. Thanks to Bob. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. So Yeah. I had that in there on the second for some reason. So, yeah, we won't be there uh, in September. So we'll be at the GCCA, the whatever that is, the weekend after Greenwater. That is now the Greenwater. Hmm. So. All right. Let's see here. What do we got going on today? So, yeah, like I said, we don't have any actual um, topic for the evening. So if you've got questions, bring them on. Uh, there was, so you did want to mention this one thing, right? It was a question. I want you to pose the question. Okay, so the dinner question that, that we were talking about? Yes. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what y'all think. When I was a kid, growing up in the previous decades, 70s, 80s, when we were outside in the summer, maybe some of you can relate. When we were outside, we would be playing. And as soon as some kid came out with a big old top lip and there was all red, the first thing we did is like, dude, you got Kool-Aid? I want Kool-Aid. And we'd rush in the house to whoever's house it was and we'd drink Kool-Aid. Now, your question was... So I asked him, I said, okay, but wait. If you went somewhere and they gave you some Kool-Aid, what would they give it to you in? So, my so go ahead... Well, no, I want I want people to answer. If you also grew up in the seventies and eighties, if you went somewhere and they it was summer and the, some other family, another mom gave you Kool Aid in a cup, in a something or another, what was it that they gave it to you in? And because I I died when he said it, because I'm like yes. So a lot of people are saying solo cups. Okay. Oh, solo cups too. Yeah, yes, that would have been true. one. Ah, boom, Mike got it. This exact same there thing that I said too. Yep. Uh, the Tupperware cup. Yeah, you had like the pink and Tupperware. the green and the blue. Grave digger got and it then too. you're like, oh yeah, man, I really want the blue one. And what I was saying is, can some of you remember that Tupperware cup was mm. interesting because it always smelled a little bit off because they those Tupperware do. cups took on the scent of anything that was put in them from the decades before that. And so you're drinking <laughs> out of this Tupperware cup and you're like, kind of smells like, I don't know, split pea soup and 
Kool-Aid and whatever and else. Probably chicken noodle uh, soup. That tea sense. and all that kinds of stuff. With, yeah. So, yeah, the Tupperware cups were definitely something to behold, but they probably lasted forever. I mean, let's face it. Kip tried to run one over with a van, and, I mean, it didn't Dang survive, it. but it could have. Uh, yeah. Lance, you look like a strong young pup. Why don't you see if you can give that a tear? The next thing I said is, all right, well, that was true if we were just going to be kind of running around and we were going to just be doing things. But if you were actually going to be sitting down at the table and maybe getting some chips and something to eat, there was a different type of cup that the Kool-Aid might go in if you were really being good. Let's see if anybody gets that. And it was made, I'll, I'll give you a hint. It was, it was actually made out of glass in the 70s and 80s, and it was really fun. <laughs> we'll see if anybody can get it. Whip's here. Awesome. Glad you're hanging out with us. See, Emma's here as well. Mug. The mug. It Well, uh, kind of, not really, because that one didn't come We didn't a have a whole... I, no. don't, I don't remember using a lot of mugs. We Probably no. back then, they only had a couple mugs. I got a lot. Jelly a lot of people jar. are guessing. Yeah. Fast food limited to glass. Yes, Grave Digger. Milk glass. We used to get it in the McDonald's, the glass McDonald's collectibles. Coca-Cola right? glass. So, and you just drink it right out of the, you know, you got Hamburglar. You had, I always wanted Grimace. So that was the one that I was, that was my go-to. Give me the Grimace uh, McDonald's cup. So yeah, that was, it was pretty awesome, Chris. Yeah. A and, glass McDonald's cup. Yep. And again, the question was, if you went over to a friend's house or something and you went inside, sat inside the house and yeah. you had something cold to drink, like lemonade or Kool-Aid, what would they serve it to you in? And of course it was the McDonald's glass. Of course we had Smurf glasses too. Mm. Yeah. Today in class, one of my students walked in. It was the first day of class, and she thought she was all cool. She had the Starbucks. No, she had the Starbucks thing, and it was just like red. It was a red drink. I'm like, you realize all you're drinking. This is what started in my brain. I'm like, you realize all you're doing is drinking Kool Aid, right? And she was like, no. She started arguing, and then she started thinking. I was like, wait a minute. Yeah, man, they just charged me a lot of money for this Kool Aid. I'm like, yeah, that's it. You're drinking Kool Aid. (laughs) So, old Smucker's jelly jars. Hmm. That's you know, right. You what I did them. one time as a kid, huh. I probably shouldn't have done this, but when when we were, gosh, this would have been the mid-80s, we moved into a house and they had all these old like mason jars, like the glass jars, like in a cellar. And they had a bunch of them. And what we did is we took them out in the backyard and blew them to pieces with BB guns. And I'm thinking maybe that wasn't the smartest idea. Like those could have, like aren't those sometimes worth money? It depends. You can get a lot of these th- things thrifted. because This of the- was from the 80s. This is not the time when... Th- thrifted things occurred you can get a lot of things from like the 30s and 40s that are not that expensive i know these look pretty ornate i'm not gonna lie like they look like they might have been somebody's special collection okay but wait cheryl said that they had the peanuts gang awesome and the muppets oh very cool yes that would be super fun cool you could have had fraggle rock if you were really lucky yeah that would have been pretty awesome rock it would have been awesome. Yeah. So anyway, all right, let's see here. If you got questions, like I said, just put at Primetime Aquatics yeah. in the question, and then that helps us understand its question. While we're here, might as well have some fish questions. I guess. Karen K said, about nine months ago on one of your live streams, you said you got something from someone at a swap, but I can't find where you ever did talk about it. Do you remember what it was? <laughs> I have no idea. I've gotten a lot of things from a lot of swaps. If I got something from a swap, it would have been either green water or GCCA. Uh, but I don't know what that would have been. But it would have been one of those two swaps for sure. Uh, let me see here. Steven says, what could be the small white worm looking fuzz on glass and substrate in my nano high tech planted tank and how to get rid of them trying Excel? Uh, small worm. Well, it could just be detritus Planari- worms or planaria. planaria. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Excel won't do much with actual, if it's a, it's a worm, it, Excel won't do anything. Um, but yeah, the detritus worms are not really a big deal. Some fish will eat them. If it's planaria and you have shrimp, that can be a bit of an issue, but they're really not all that dangerous for fish either. So usually it's an indication if they are in fact worms that maybe there's a little bit too much food and detritus in the actual substrate is starting to accumulate. And then those things as a result start to grow a little bit out of control. I, I mean, I've had tanks before with larger gravel and these the detritus worms really start to grow. And then, I mean, I had, it was really problematic when I was... I had a breeding tank with super red bristlenose and a 20 long 
And it just so happened that I started that breeding colony on gravel. Not a great idea because then I'm feeding these fish rapache and all these sinking pellets and they're making a mess when they eat them. And then there's some uneaten food that gets into the substrate and bristle moles don't eat these worms. So I can remember times where I'd be gravel vacuuming that tank and big clumps of detritus worms would be coming out. You have to shake the gravel vac and get them out. And you just eventually Gross. we cut back on, ref on feeding the rapache and then we fed uh, more um, sinking pellets that they could eat a little bit faster and it, the problem went away. But if it's worms, fish will eat them. If it's a shrimp only tank and you've got planaria, that could be a bigger problem. All right, Michael uh, wants to know, let's see, I am looking for an active school uh, to go in with my peacock gudgeons in sparkling garami in a 29 gallon, uh, 6.8 pH. Oh, so you've got tons of options with that pH. Most of your rasboras and your tetras will be just fine. I mean, they would prefer that over the pH that we run them at, which is like an 8 to an 8.2. So uh, peacock gudgeons, honey garami, you've got a lot of your, let's see, your galaxy rasboras, your dwarf emerald rasboras. You have things like um, green kubatai rasbora, uh, ember tetras, all your neon types, black neons, greens, standards. Uh, Cardinal Tetras at a pH of 6.8 would be uh, a nice, really pretty option as well. So, yeah, I mean, you've got almost all the types of Rasporas and Tetras that you could possibly think of at a pH of 6.8 would probably be pretty happy there. Cheryl says, your shirt reminds me. Your shirt, Joanna's shirt, reminds me of vintage primetime aquatics, black, orange, and yellow. Right. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's, a, that's an old school shirt. That was one of the first ones that we had out there. It was. A, it, was. it was an orange, yellow, red. was there another color? And red try. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was in the Wayback Machine. Yeah. Not many people have that shirt because I don't think we had it in a big run and it was early on. Mm -hmm. So if anybody's it's got that very shirt, it would be. rare. Yeah, it's a rare, it's a collectible. <laughs> so if you have that primetime shirt, it's a collectible shirt for people who collect shirts of, of people. Yeah, for sure. Anthony says, don't forget the plastic Kool-Aid barrels. I don't remember plastic Kool-Aid barrels. Plastic Kool-Aid barrels. I don't either. I don't think we had those. I, would, I do remember, yeah. and I think they still have these. They're like little tiny drink barrels that you just buy like that. They're like that big, and they're yeah. super sugary. But they had a very interesting, weird flavor. But I remember them being good. I, I know that on Friday nights when I go over to my buddy's house, he had Dukes of Hazards um, trays that you could eat off of, like the you know the whatever they are, the dinner tray, the mm -hmm. whatever those I, what are those called? TV uh, like a uh, TV tray, yeah, yeah, with the Dukes of Hazard plastic plates and bowls and cups and stuff, and then we watched Dukes of Hazards, and it was pretty, oh, it was pretty it's awesome. The best, yep, it was the best. Yeah. Michael says, "Thank you for your suggestions, you guys. I will be looking to get some." From Flip Aquatics. Awesome. Great place to uh, to do some shopping. Tell them we said, hey, what's up? Danny, thank you so much for the super chat. What shell dweller species can I have in a 10-gallon, and how would I set up a tank for them? Could I have a Nubius and fern on rocks as decorations? So 10 gallons kind of small. You can certainly have a breeding pair in a 10-gallon, provided that they get along okay. So your Maltese and your Simulus would work just fine. The, the only issue you're going to have is if and when they do start to breed, you're going to have to constantly be removing fry because eventually with a 10-gallon tank, that's not a lot of space, and you're going to probably have a lot more aggression there uh, just because there's not, like I said, there's not space there in the 10-gallon. But it's a pretty simple setup. I mean, you just sand, shells. If you just have a pair, you could throw six or eight or ten shells in there and let them figure it out. And then eventually, like I said, once they start breeding, when the fry are at probably three quarters of an inch, half inch, you're going to want to start scooping them out just to keep the the number of fish low in that tank and the aggression low. As far as the Anubias and Java fern, Maltese, similar, the shell dwellers don't eat plants. The only thing, and I think the reason why you're suggesting putting them on rocks, which is a good suggestion, is just so that they're not digging up the substrate and then... The plants are not rooted. So, messy, yeah, you could glue. Messy. Anubias might be an easier thing to do than even the fern, although Bobitis. both are fine. Yeah. Bobitis will be fine. You could glue it to rocks, and then it'll it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's certainly doable. 
Virtue uh, Virtual says, any tips for finding a non-aggressive betta in a store? I'm planning to mix a betta and some nearite snails in a five gallon. Um, I don't know if there's any tricks. I don't have any tricks. I usually, I think, just go by the betta I think is cool looking. Because you never know how they're going to act once you get them into a tank. Sometimes you'll get fish that look like they're going to be not all that aggressive. And then they get into a tank and it's like, wow, this was way worse than I thought it was going to be. The one thing I will say is if it's just going to be the betta and the nearite snails in a five gallon, put the snails in there first and then add the betta later. And sometimes, because some fish are curious, some bettas are curious, if you put the betta in first and then the snails, sometimes they start more or less just out of curiosity, start picking at the snail just to see like, what is this? Can I eat this thing? But if the snails are there first, sometimes that curiosity isn't as great. And we've we've done bettas and mystery snails, that combination I don't know how many dozens of times and never had an issue. So, all right, let me see here. Bryce says, I need advice on a bad hydra infestation in a betta tank. Generally speaking, the only time I've had serious hydra infestations is when I was feeding live baby brine. So if you're doing that, if you're feeding live foods, cut back on that. Uh, that will help cut back on the hydra infestation, especially if you're feeding live baby brine for any reason. If it's a betta tank, and it's the only thing in the tank, it, make sure that the food that you're feeding is just being eaten by the betta and it's not getting into the water column. But if the food is not floating around the water column, if it's not like really fine crushed up flake, it's not live baby brine, usually the hydra don't have a lot to eat and they start going away. The, you don't get nearly as much of it on there. But for me, it's all about controlling food. From Just Fly Nova, I have a 10 gallon with four quarries and three skirt tetras. Should I get a bigger tank? My parents say no. Well, for the fish you have, yes. All right. I'm not overruling your parents. So to be clear on that, if they've said no, I guess they have the final authority. But when it comes to just the fish inhabitants, yeah, skirt tetras get actually fairly large. I've seen skirt tetras that were approaching three inches and they're taller bodied and they can be finippy and they can be aggressive with one another and so ideally with the skirt tetras i would want for me i'm probably not putting skirt tetras in anything less than a 40 breeder even a 29s i think are, are a little bit small long term because i also want them in pretty large groups so groups of 8 to 10 12 or so and to do that usually a 40 gallon breeder is a pretty good option the quarry cats too if they're standard quarry cats, they even though they don't get huge and they're not aggressive or anything, uh, sometimes proportionally in a 10-gallon, they don't necessarily look ideal in that size tank. And so for the quarry cats, other than, like, let's say, Habrosis quarries, Pygmy quarries, those can certainly be in a 10-gallon. But most standard quarries, your salt and peppers, your pandas, that kind of thing, I'd prefer them in a 20 as well just because it just looks more proportionally correct. And that's just my opinion on the quarries. But definitely the skirt tetras could use a bigger tank and more of them in that tank. Okay, let's see here. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm a Mac or a guy. Maybe Mac. Okay, what kind of peaceful cichlid can I keep in a... It says 2P gallon aquarium. I'm thinking... Should that be a 20 gallon aquarium? Why don't you, if you hear me, why don't you um, send another uh, update? Yeah. Is it? Well, I'll just 20? answer it. Two gallon, none. Yep. Uh, 20 gallon, you've got some options in terms of. Oh, 20 gallon, yeah. yeah. So you've got things like in a 20 gallon, your rams, depending on your water parameters. And you'd have to really, you know, do your research here because I'm going to throw out a bunch of examples, but. Um, or options, but the water parameters are going to matter. So you've got your your rams, whether they're Bolivian or your German blue rams or their derivatives. You have a pistogramma. You have checkerboard cichlids. Um, and a 20, let's see, what else What else can we do? Uh, the different types of crebenzis might work out okay. In any case, if you're doing cichlids, know that if you get a pair, they're going to become territorial. And if you've got more than a pair in there, sometimes you're going to get some fighting. If you have a pair that forms and they start breeding, they might start chasing your other fish around. So one, obviously, is going to ensure that that doesn't happen as much. Uh, but once you start adding more than one, it could happen. It doesn't always happen. I had, I've had groups of Crebenzis in a 20-gallon for years, and it worked out okay. 
I've had two pair, Joanna had two pairs of crebenzas in her 20 long, and because of the way that the tank was set up with driftwood and rocks and plants, they pretty much just stayed on either side of the tank and almost never interacted. So, yeah. but those are all options. I'm trying to think of if there's anything else. But those are all relative, they can be relatively peaceful, but you never know 100% of the time with cichlids. Sometimes you get these cichlids that are supposed to be peaceful, and the next thing you know, they're chasing each other around or chasing another fish. Like, what the heck, man? Everybody says these are supposed to be nice fish. Yeah, sometimes you get some cichlids with some screws loose. <laughs> yeah, they can be a little unpredictable sometimes. Yeah. John says, my daughter and I are new to the new are new to this. Well, that's cool. Glad you're here. We have had six Daniels in a five-gallon tank and lost three in a month. What could be wrong? Test and water change weekly. KH is... Uh, less than 200 parts per million or, or more than 200 parts per million uh, pH I'm assuming that's an 8 NO2 NO3 is 0 I would be curious as to your ammonia levels because usually the first thing that's going to spike is ammonia and that's a separate test right so when you are buying the test kits usually the ammonia test is separate and that's the most important because it's the first thing that spikes when a tank is not cycled. The fat, and what really kind of makes me wonder is your nitrite and nitrate is zero. And usually your nitrate is going to be, there's going to be something in there if, you, if the tank is cycled. It's, it's ideal that nitrite is zero, ammonia is zero, and that there is probably some type of nitrate happening because the microbes are processing the ammonia and nitrite. So my guess is that there is some nitrate in the tank. As far as the KH at 200 parts per million is that high, not for Daniels. Daniels will be fine with that. So, and the other thing too is Daniels for us, and for a lot of people, they're very hardy. For us, they're not. And that's why generally you don't really see them in our in our fish room because I don't really have the best luck with Daniels. I don't know if it's just because of how much they breed them and maybe pet stores don't always look at the quality with a fish like that because they're so cheap. But I generally don't do Daniels. And in a five gallon, that can be really tough too because Daniels can be a little bit fin nippy. They prefer to be in larger groups. So I generally don't do Daniels in a five gallon. If I were going to do them, I mean, they're small fish. So a 10 gallon can work, but I probably prefer to have like 15 or 20 in a 20 gallon. But my, I suspect you've got an ammonia spike going on there. All right, Rhonda says, uh, my betta's top fin is stiff and looks stuck together, and it's also lethargic. Water parameters are perfect, uh, changed anyways. Temperature is 81. All right, so water parameters, again, water, perfect water parameters to me mean no ammonia, no nitrite, nitrate at 20 parts per million or less. Don't know how old the betta is. Um, again, and one of the things that we've talked about in previous videos is sometimes because bettas are crazy, crazy overbred. The life expectancy of bettas, I think now compared to five, 10, 15 years ago, it's just less. The bettas are just not as resilient and as they as they used to be. So it might not be anything that you're doing. It might just be the bettas a little bit older. It might just be the bettas genetics aren't that great. Um, if the water parameters are fine, there's no other obvious signs of disease. You haven't added any new stuff to the tank. It just could be that there's the bettas at towards the end of its life, unfortunately. Uh, for a lot of bettas, it just seems like now if they live for a year or longer, you're like, oh, that's pretty good if you're already buying them full size at the store because they're not living as long as they used to, at least in my opinion. Some of them live a very long time, but not always. Andy, thanks for being a member the last 11 months. Appreciate it. Andy. I picked up a trio of cichlids from you, and I cannot remember the name can I put something else with them in the you, 55? He's got, he's, you got my, oh, you got my, have? they're the, my, the ones I, I was very attached to. And I was very the happy that Andy got. Nano. And I would, I could never remember the name. And I would always call them the ones underneath the severum. Ones underneath the severum. No, no the Exul? Yeah. Didn't they, didn't, aren't they I like don't. orange, like a deep, um, orange, orange bronze with like blue on the, on the um, fins. I don't, I don't, I didn't think he got the actual. I thought there might have been. All right, so did you get that? I know you got the the rusties, right? 
So you, you got the Rusties, but that's African Cichlids. The Trio, I thought was either the Cryptoheros Nanoludius. Could have been the Exul, I <laughs> suppose. Uh, give us more information. What color are they? Cause what do they look you, like? You've gotten some fish from us now, and I can't remember all of them. Oh, light, light brown, brown with a black stripe. Light, light brown, brown with a black, black stripe. I'm pretty sure that would have been, yeah, 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 that would have been the Cryptoheros nanoludius. Oh. They have blue eyes, and, yeah, they're they're pretty easygoing fish. So in a 55-gallon, you should be fine putting general community fish in with them. I never had a problem doing that. What tank were they in? They were in the bottom 33 with the Gua... Oh, wait a minute. It was either them or the Guayanacara, Sturgiosi, but those were more silver. So if they were more of a silver fish, the Guayanacara, Sturgiosi, but those are another fish where I never had a problem keeping them with relatively greater than neon-sized community fish. They're pretty easy going. Let's see. Mick, Mr. Eric Mosher, thank you so much for the super chat. Is Blackbeard algae dangerous heavily planted with five adult paradise fish 50 plus babies uh past fry 12 quarry six year old just no black beard algae is not it's not anything to be feared at least in terms of fish health fish just leave it alone uh they don't most fish don't eat it with the exception of siamese algae eaters you could try that in a 50 gallon but you've got fry in there so siamese algae eaters can get pretty big and they're pretty fast so there's a chance they could eat fry but I suppose yo-yo loaches could too. I don't know if they'll really go out of their way to do that. But no, it's not dangerous. It's unsightly sometimes. People who have planted tanks don't like the way it looks. And sometimes it can be, it can overrun plants and start to kill off some of your plants, especially your slow growing ones like Anubias and stuff. But to the fish, no, it's, it's fine. Christy, thank you so much for being a member the last three months. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Um, Melissa says, I bought a short body flower horn. The man at the pet store said it could be with my other fish. That was not the case. Do they <laughs> like being by themselves? Um, by the way, I did not know um, it was a flower horn to purchase. Yeah, flower horns are, are ideally kept alone. Right? It's kind of like one of those things where you get them a 75-gallon tank and you put the fish in there and and let the flower horn just be a flower horn. But they, generally speaking, don't tolerate other fish very well and will often try to kill anything else you put in the tank. There are just some fish that are like that. Flower horns are like that. Dovi are like that. Some of, you know, some of your large South Central American cichlids can be like that, where it's just like, I'm going to keep one big one, and it's going to recognize me, and it's going to go crazy at the tank. And sometimes I put my hand in there, it's going to want to take a chunk out of my arm. But it's a cool fish. So, yeah, I would... To me, if I'm keeping flower horns, I just keep them on their own. That's why I don't do that because I don't want to dedicate an entire tank to one fish. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Lots of people do it, love it. It's just not something that I like to do. Oh, and I saw something. Natural Culture says, have, have a, a car I added to my 40 gallon all as well for a while. Now he's killing off tank mates one by one. Any tips to break up aggression, have plants, driftwood? Have mollies and rainbow fish for an acara, electric blue acara. I've never actually had an electric blue acara even show remotely any aggression towards other fish. If it's doing that, chances are it's not going to stop. So if, if it's beating the snot out of your mollies and your rainbows, I would get rid of the acara. I would just, it, 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 obviously that acara has got some issues. Bring it back to the pet store, wherever you got it from. Be like, hey, this thing did not work out. Here you go have it back they'll take it back because they're pretty fish and they can resell them but or get another tank yeah or or get another tank but if it's not working it's not working and i could see that happening you know if it was a there were other cichlids in the tank and and that can happen sometimes but every once in a while that's why i always say have a backup plan especially when you're keeping cichlids because sometimes there are fish that we say are relatively peaceful and then you wind up with one that's like yeah thanks a lot this thing is not being peaceful at all it's being the bane of my existence there is a fly wham sorry i just whoosh. did you get him no well i smacked him i kind of smacked him away so somehow a fly got headache. in the house i don't like that <laughs> yeah all right let me see here oh camden says do you guys ever collect your own rocks for your tanks wherever i go i collect rocks i am a rock collector um occasionally they will go in uh, aquariums a lot of times they'll go just in gardens or kind of paludarium sort of looking things but uh, yeah generally speaking 
um, for aquariums, we go to the fish store or the landscaping place. Landscaping place, yeah. I mean, there's you see on the internet sometimes where like, okay, you can do the rock test with the um, what's it, the acetic acid, muriatic acid maybe. And if it fizzes, then it might change your water hardness and that kind of stuff. But our, we found our water is so hard that even, we add like the flagstone and pretty much anything you get from a landscaping place is, it doesn't really do anything to our water. So, uh, but still, you got to be a little bit careful with rocks you just pull out of a river or a lake because they could still be colonized with different types of microbes, potentially some pathogens. And if it goes from the lake or the river and it's not properly cleaned directly into your aquarium, that could be a problem with at least for me, I feel a little bit safer buying them from landscaping places because they've probably been out in a you know a big giant mound of rocks where they've been dried and they've been in the sun for possibly weeks, if not months. And so anything really but spore forming microbes are going to die in that process. Uh, the drying process can be a really good antimicrobial process. And people ask all the time, hey, if I've got a gravel vac and my fish tank had ick, what do I do with the gravel vac? What I generally do is I take the gravel back and I don't use it for a week or two, set it aside, and when it's fully dry, the ick is dead. The ick's not going to survive that. So uh, drying can be a really good thing. Kayla's Fish Room says, have you ever used CK, CK filters? I am wanting a quieter filter for my 40-gallon breeder. Uh, I, I used very, very briefly one of the internal filters just because we had an issue when our central air system pump was a little bit weak for the amount of lines that we had back when we had 80 tanks. And so before I got the larger pump, there was a couple tanks in the very back corner where one of the sponge filters wasn't working. And so I used one there. It was fine. I, I didn't have, I don't have any complaints about it, but I, I don't generally use the internal filters. I just, for me, if I'm going to plug something in and I'm going to use power for a filter on a tank, I just like hang on back filters. I like them because it's so simple to change out the filter floss or the sponge. You just go in there. You're not digging through the tank. You're not trying to grab a filter that's submerged in water. It's just sitting there on the back. Pull the stuff out. Put the new stuff in. It takes three seconds. Uh, so, but I do I do appreciate why people would want to use an internal canister filter. And I've done a video on them before because one, yeah, they're usually pretty quiet because they are fully submerged, and so there's no motors running outside the tank potentially. There's no risk of flooding your home with an internal canister filter because it's all inside the tank, where if you know something happens to a hang on back filter, it's pretty rare that these things happen, but it's possible that a hang on back filter could get clogged up. The return could get clogged in some way or slowed down, and now the water's coming out of the back. It's happened to us uh, a few, more than a few times with different types of filters. So there are advantages to using some of the internal filters, which I think CK is one of the, that's kind of their focus. Um, we do use the Seachem Tidal line, which is kind of the, it's in a similar realm there. Uh, we'll use those. We'll use some of the Marineland Pro filters. We've got some Aqua Clear hang on backs as well. So a lot of different types. Oh, I just had one. Where'd you did, go? did you? I did. Oh, Steel Waves. Uh, I'm worried my new Episto Panduro isn't getting enough food, competing with my Purple Emperor and Von Rio Tetras. He seems too timid. Any suggestions? He ate fine in quarantine. I'm thinking. Um, you could try... So your Panduros, generally speaking, ideally they're going to eat towards the bottom of the tank where most of the fish that you just mentioned are going to go crazy as soon as you put the food in so possibly one of the things that i would try is getting some micro pellets and flake food and feeding those at relatively the same time and so feed well actually i would feed the flake food first and i would let my tetras go crazy so any fish that's just they absolutely go nuts like for us it's our volcano tetras it's our rainbow fish where they just lose their minds when it's time to eat. Mm -hmm. And so I put that flake food that's floating in there. And yeah, at this point, the Pandora is probably not eating all that much because all the other fish are like, pow, 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 pow. they're eating all the food at the top. They're eating the food that's slightly starting to sink. Once they've gone through a couple rounds of that and they're starting to slow down a little bit, then maybe I put a little bit more flake food to kind of distract them and keep them focused on that. And then add some of those smaller pellets for your Panduro, like the one millimeter pellets that we use from like Northfin, those cichlid pellets, community pellets, those will sink. And then he'll be able to go down there and, and more of that's going to fall to the bottom. You don't want to overfeed your fish and just absolutely, you know, bomb your tank with full of fish food. But that's probably something that I would do. 
Ross, are my comments visible? They are not. I did <laughs> not see that comment. That was invisible. I didn't see it. Karen um. Kay says, I had a male betta, four Adolphi Corys, and a small Pleco in a 10-gallon. Would like to add CPDs. Would, uh, would they work out okay, or would something else be better? Uh, male betta, small pleco. So what is that pleco? I mean, the only pleco I would put in a 10 might be a clown pleco because even the bristle moles are going to get considerably too large long term. So just keep that in mind. Um, even the adult uh, quarries might get a little large for that 10 gallon. But in terms of CPDs and, and um, a betta, that, that could work as long as the CPDs are not super small because sometimes you can get those CPDs from a store and not realize how small they are until you put them in the tank with the beta and all of a sudden you're like, I had six, I'm down to four, and then three days later, like I'm down to two, I don't find the rest of them, but my beta is not eating its flake food as much because it decided to munch on the very, very small CPDs, but usually they come in at a decent size, so they could potentially get along. Uh, you just gotta be careful, it's never 100% for sure thing. If you've got a male beta with long fins and the CPDs are hungry, they might try to see that those fins as potentially something to eat. Oh, so Ross asks, how do you get the box over the at name for specific people? I think that's just when you type in. So usually like, all right, if I were to go on the bottom here and I were to type in at Mac, just because you're there, Mac 22, it, at least on PC, it comes up right away. And then- Oh, it doesn't on phone. And so off. I just typed in at Mac and then it just started to fill in the rest because it knew that Mac was in the chat. And I said, so I said, yo, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is a CPD? Celestial Pearl Daniel, otherwise known as the Galaxy Rasbora. Very so cool, cute. very small fish, lots of color. Dark blue has white dots all over it that makes it look like a starry night sky. And then they get red fins. Looks like a uh, mini, teeny, tiny trout. Yeah, it's a highly desirable nano fish. And they're pretty good for a five-gallon tank or above. I like them. Super fun. Bit. You know what we need to do? What? I think. I think it's time. I think it's time. Do you have a? Have you prepared your side of the deal here? Um. Because it's time. To do. Oh wait. She's messing around. Anyway, while she's figuring yeah, that it. out. I got yeah, it. Yeah. Well, it says, I'm looking at my three adorable CPDs right now. I know they're Aww. cool fish. They really are. Tell I me like so them. Hi. Yep. Ooh, hi, that Noel. fly is back. Hold on. Oh, geez. Oh, now it's way up there on the camera. It's Look at that. It's on one of the lights. Oh, man. So not cool. That's going to be really distracting. If you had like a rubber band, you could go pew. M&C says, would Tiger Limia be okay with, in a 40 long with rainbows and tetras? Yeah. yeah, for sure. Tiger Lemia are cool fish, not aggressive. I mean, if you've got little tiny babies, maybe. I mean, rainbows don't have big uh, big mouths, but the Tiger Lemia babies might be small enough where sometimes you might see a few go missing. But other than that, in terms of their attitudes, everything should get along just fine, especially in a 40 long. Okay, so let me, let me talk about what is going on for this giveaway. I told you at the beginning that it's kind of random in the sense that I normally I have a theme. I have like a, oh, here's this giveaway and it's all kind of the same thing. This is not the same thing. Would you agree? Okay. <laughs> you don't get a chance to agree. You're just gonna have to agree. So first thing is a product that we have used a million times that I think really should be for people who are considering setting up tanks. It should be something that you just have in the fish room and that is my beloved Fritzheim 7. This is all from Fritz Aquatics. They send us the stuff. They are channel sponsors. And one of the things they do as channel sponsors is really give us a lot of product to give to you. And that's one of the things that I like to do. Uh, so when I talk to potential channel sponsors, they have to be on board with that. And Fritz is not only on board with that, they encourage it because they like to support the hobby. And this is high quality stuff. And so what Fritzheim 7 is, if you don't know, uh, Fritzheim 7 is live nitrifying bacteria. So anytime you're starting a new tank, you add this, you add that beneficial bacteria to your aquarium, and then right away you can add a small number of fish to your tank that are going to produce the ammonia that the bacteria in this bottle are going to convert to nitrite, and the bacteria in this bottle will convert the nitrite to nitrate and then accomplish that nitrification. So 
that's this, all right? This Fritz Lime 7, it is a, I don't know how many ounces this is, 16 ounces. So this is good for quite a bit. Uh, love this stuff. And if, for those who have never had it, never tried it before and are setting up new tanks, you should have this. Uh, Michael says, does it need to be in a refrigerator? We put the stuff in a refrigerator when we're using it, just especially after you open it, because while the solution will definitely keep the bacteria viable for a long time, like this doesn't expire until the middle of next year, 2024. So, I mean, it's good for a long time, but the fridge definitely helps, you know, the cooler the temperatures, the less likely any type of spoilage or anything is going to happen. So this is the first thing you're getting, Fritz Lime 7. And then, like I said, I have no theme here, but it's another Fritz product. I guess that's the theme. Uh, the glass cleaner, this is really good. You might wonder why a, a company would even bother making a glass cleaner when there's readily commercially available glass cleaners out there. Well, this is aquarium safe. And that's a big thing because especially if you've got tanks that are not fully covered and you're squirt, 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 squirt. If a little tiny bit of this gets in the tank, like a little bit of the, you know, the, the after spray or whatever, it's not the end of the world. So this is a little bit more fish safe than your standard ammonia based um, cleaners. And it works really well. In fact, pro tip, you can actually use this to clean like that, the filmy stuff that's in the windows of your car. And it works way better than like stuff like Windex. This stuff is good. I love the Fritz glass cleaner. So check that out. And the last thing in my non-theme themed giveaway, I don't know, I just felt like I wanted to throw in some catapa leaves. And so for those of you who are setting up tanks and you wanna have some botanicals in your tank, you wanna go that route, you put these bad boys in there. These are big leaves, so you could crack them up into thirds or quarters or pieces. But these are nice because if you're like breeding shrimp or you've got small fish, sometimes they'll hide in there. If you're breeding fish, sometimes shrimplets or fish will pick off of microorganisms. There are, are little organisms that are growing around this. You could throw these directly into your aquarium and then it will give you that, that darker water look, that tannin stained look, which I happen to like. So that will definitely happen if you just chuck these into your tank. If you don't want that to happen, you can boil them first. Two things will happen if you boil them. One, the tannins will be removed. And so that brown color that you would see, uh, that will be removed. And they will also sink a little bit faster because when you first put these into an aquarium, they will sometimes float. And they eventually sink after a few days. But this is really cool stuff if you're into that dark water tank, if you want the more natural look at the bottom of your aquarium to have some of these leaves. And so all of those things are going to one winner. Now, let me explain how this works. The winner has to live in the 48 continental United States and has to be over the age of 18. Now, in order to win, what you have to do... But wait, you have what? to be... All right. Always have to say, you have to be in all messages, not top messages, all messages. Yeah, and that helps just because it helps with the order in which we're appearing because this is the first person who guess is the number which you can go now it's between 1 and 20 so a number between 1 and 20 is the number that we are going to be looking for oh done yep. we already got it you can stop typing now wow that it was happened. fast yeah it happened very fast it, one day it's going to happen like the first number that goes in is going to be the number that didn't happen this time well, that would but be fun. it would be crazy but it happened very very quickly so uh, let's see here. Let's just all confirm. You're confirming that uh, this yes. is the number. Okay. So Jeff Mullins, you are the winner because you guessed 17 and you're the first 17, 17 that showed up on all of our screens. So thank you so much for playing. Uh, now here's what you have to do. Jeff, the winner of this wonderful thing is you have to send an email. And here's the email address. It's prime time giveaway. Singular all one word, primetime giveaway at yahoo.com. Send us your mailing address and Joanna will get this stuff out to you in the next few days. And congratulations, you've got a whole bunch of stuff Yay, now, new goodies. things to, to use in the fish room. And don't worry, if you didn't win, I promise there will be more giveaways because Fritz Aquatics, who is a channel sponsor, Flip Aquatics, who is a channel sponsor, are very, very generous with the things that they supply for you. And I think we really have to kind of get going with some of these giveaways because I, I just looked through our cases of stuff and I'm like, really? we I don't know if we slacked off or what happened, but huh. yeah, we've got some things that we have to be, be doing here. So uh, yeah, pretty excited about this fall fish keeping season because there are some things, <laughs> there are some things that are going to be given away in the future. 
Now, if you happen to ask a question before the giveaway, usually what happens is I can't scroll high enough to see a lot of what happened before everybody Big started on. typing in numbers. So if you've got a question, just retype it down starting now because, yeah, it's it's not going to be there anymore. Melissa says, are you going to <laughs> going to link these products in description? You know, let me see here if I can do that for you. I might do that right now. Joanna, go ahead and start asking, answering questions while I... Well, right. I do that. Oh, is um, Michael S. is a AQ advisor a good reference to go by when stocking a tank? It's not bad. Um, I would say as far as it? that stuff goes, the Aqua Advisor thing, it gets it gets somewhat close. I mean, that, that was the idea behind what we did with some of our uh, the videos that we did with the stocking options that seems like so bright now yeah i'm trying to look through the website here to see where i can best find this uh let me do this boom boom and i'm going to put this in i wonder if it'll mess things up how about all right i'll do we'll it do after, after the live stream yeah i've got it copy and pasted for the whole putting the links in there but aqua advisor it, it seems like it gets pretty close to, I mean, it's way better than the one inch per gallon rule and stuff like that. But that, again, that was why I did the stocking options ideas for pretty much every type of tank. So people could get an idea of, all right, how many schooling fish can I have? How many cat, you know, cleanup crew type quarry catfish or things like that, or centerpiece fish. And you get an idea of, okay, here's the sizes of the fish that he's talking about. Here's the quantities. And then you can kind of piece it together and you don't have to go exactly with what I say, but ton of suggestions there for you um mac 22 hey uh how many um rasboras rummy rasboras do you keep in a school let's say a dozen yeah i mean a dozen is depends a nice on the size group, of the tank but obviously but i wouldn't go any smaller than a 20 probably for them would you put I them mean, in anything I, could, I would put them in a 10 they're not very active would you they're really not i mean in terms of being crazy it's true and they don't around, really I, I wouldn't mind a 10 but then i'd probably do no more than 10 to 12 in a 10 gallon. And I do like, I, I do think a 20 is more ideal. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that 20 long, you had what, 15 or 16 in there? And that that didn't seem, and, it, and quite a few plants, and that didn't seem like it was crazy mm -hmm. overstocked or anything. I thought it was Depends. appropriately stocked. Who else you want to put in there too? Yeah. Yeah. Jared says, I am brand new. Well, oh. glad you're here. I have nothing. Wow. That's a good start. <laughs> How long should I have my tank set up before adding fish? Four seconds. So let me let me be really careful because you're brand new. So you set up your tank. You dechlorinate the water. You got it all running. The filter is running. This Fritzheim 7 stuff that I was talking about, this is live nitrifying bacteria. If you had an aquarium, let's say it's a 10 gallon, 20 gallon, it doesn't really matter. So we add this as directed. And then once you add that, you you can add maybe a fish or two, right? I wouldn't go crazy. I wouldn't just go out and buy all the fish that you're going to buy for that aquarium. But you can add a small number of fish. And then you wait a couple of weeks and you make sure that you have no ammonia spikes, or no nitrite spikes. And then you can add a couple more fish. And the, the key here is that take your time with it. Have fun with it. Add fish slowly. Make sure that your ecosystem is stable. But this stuff makes cycling the tank and having to wait four to six weeks irrelevant. It This will do that job for you. And the other thing, too, that some pet stores are doing, especially around us now, is they are selling cycled filter media, which I think is brilliant. I've mentioned this probably, or I've been saying this for maybe 10 years, that they, that the stores should just sell their cycled media as long as it's coming from a safe aquarium where there's no disease. That's what we do, right? Between using this and then taking filter media from one tank that's established and putting it in, in a new tank, that works well as well. Melissa asks, is that the same as Quick Start? No, not even close. Great question. I'm glad you asked. So that Quick Start, I, I believe, I got to be really careful here. I believe Quick Start is just a solution that, that encourages microbial growth that might be existing in the tank. I'm fairly certain if that's what I'm, let me do, hold on. I don't want to say wrong things here. Let me not misspeak. Um, that's API quick start. Yeah, this is from what I remember. It's not beneficial bacteria. Although, no, now they, I wonder if they've changed it. 
API quick start nitrifying bacteria allows instant addition of fish. So maybe they do have, maybe this is the one that has, see, that's why I wanted to look it up. Uh, if it has live nitrifying bacteria, then it might serve the same purpose. I haven't used this stuff in forever. And I, I always thought, at least at one point, it was just a solution that encouraged growth, but it didn't actually contain live nitrifying bacteria. But I could be wrong. So if it does, and I'm not going to just read through this whole thing because that gets boring for you. If it does contain live nitrifying bacteria, then yeah, it would be similar. But that's what you're looking for. So whatever product you're purchasing needs to have live nitrifying bacteria, not just be a solution that enhances growth of existing bacteria because that stuff is worthless when it does that. Zen Ginger is in the house. What's up? Glad you're here. Hey. Glad you're here. All right, let's see here. What else we've got going on? Looking through the thing. Looking through the thing. Emma says, I don't trust Quick Start. I always tell my customers for its time seven or stability. Yeah, stability is another one. Because this has worked every single time we've used it, I will not change. I mean, if, if something has worked every time, then why would I change, right? And so that, that has. And for most people I know, Fritz Time 7 has a really good reputation. All right, Mike's been a member for three months. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I'm starting to see black lines on my Severums, also on my chocolate cichlid. They almost look like veins. Any thoughts? I already dosed salt. Yeah, I probably have to see pictures. Um, I, I always start with water parameters, make sure that everything's okay there. If you haven't added anything new to the aquarium, it'd be tough to see. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a parasite. So I'd need a lot more background information and probably pictures to really think about that a little bit more. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for the super chat. And guys, I just wanted to give back to you guys for all the great and informative videos you guys make every week. You are truly my uh, true heroes. P.S. Can't wait to see you guys at my first Aquashella in November. Awesome, oh, looking forward to exciting. it. So glad you're gonna wait. be there in Daytona. That's gonna be super cool. Um, yeah, well, thank you, I appreciate it. Glad you're here and glad you're gonna be there too. Anybody else gonna be at Aquashella in Daytona in November? Yeah, Noel, did you say, uh, I don't know if Noel's still here. Did you say that you were going to the, the November one? Why do I think that, or did I dream it? I don't know. You're just having random dreams about could be like, we know from YouTube yes. saying that they're going to be yeah. in Daytona. Yeah, that's could not happen. weird or anything. You wake oh, up. Whip says I'm hoping to be. Cool, what? that would be awesome. Sweet. Yep, but yeah, if you're in the area, I mean, if it's something that you can do, if you've especially if you've never been to an Aquashella, oh yeah, it's well worth it. It's it's a it's definitely a cool experience. You know, I think everybody should go at least one time in their life, and I know a lot of people who go every year that it's you know whatever. Aqua Shell is closest to them geographically, or maybe they just want to take a vacation to Florida. Now they've got an excuse to go down to Daytona or Dallas or something like that. And like I said, next year it's back in Chicago in August. So it's going to be cool. Guppy Girl has a fun question. All right, bring it. Bring it. I read that plants respirate at night, increasing CO2 levels. Can you explain why pH drops? Should I add more KH to the water to keep pH from fluctuating? Tap water pH is 6.8 and DKH is 2. Okay, so all really great questions and very good background information. So, all right, yes, plants, when the lights are on, they are producing, they're utilizing CO2, producing oxygen, and the pH is whatever it is, so 6.8 in this case. You do have very low KH, so that could be a concern in terms of your plants at night, yeah, all plants, when the lights go out, the whole reason why they do photosynthesis is to store energy in the form of sugars that they can use when the light is not shining. And so at night, algae, plants, what they're doing is they switch to aerobic respiration, which is the same thing that we do. And so now they're breaking down the sugars that they've stored and consuming oxygen releasing CO2, and to answer your question, that CO2, when it is in an aqueous solution, often is converted to carbonic acid. That lowers pH. Now, it doesn't have that big of an impact if your KH is high because your KH is the buffering capacity of your water. 
That's why generally speaking, as your KH increases, the pH also increases, but it also remains relatively stable. And so in the situation that you're talking about, a very heavily planted tank could experience fluctuations in pH. So if it's at a 6.8 during the day, maybe it goes down to a 6.2 or a 6.1 or a 6.0 at night, and then it goes back up when the lights come on and the plants switch from aerobic respiration back to photosynthesis. Raising KH could help that. So if you went from two degrees, maybe up to five, six, seven degrees, if you do do that, do it slowly. If you do that, I would use means that are going to be more stable. And so maybe adding aragonite or maybe you're doing something like using an, a, a, a carob C African cichlid mix or crushed coral or, coral or something like that so that you have stability there. Because the last thing you want to do is be using some type of powdered form or liquid form of KH um, enhancer or something that's going to increase KH. And now that's fluctuating. And now you've got two things fluctuating over time. So and the key there is slowly, right? Because you do have plants and fish and organisms in the tank that are that are used to their their metabolic processes are accounting for the fact that your your KH is a two and your pH is a six eight. So if you do start increasing that too quickly, that can mess things up for you a little bit. Keith, thank you so much for being a member for the last twenty five months. Hope to see you at Daytona. Shella, keep up the good work. We are planning to be there. So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you there. Sweet. Hanging out. And Timothy brings up a great point. It's back in Chicago next year. Mm -hmm. Woohoo! We can't That's wait. True. And then uh, Noelle said um, initially she was going to go to Daytona, but probably the Dallas one next May. Very and cool. then you get to visit your family. That's right. Oh, nice. And you get to meet the infamous, the one and only, well, the two and, two and only, Shannon and Ryan of Second Floor Aquatics. Yep. Lucky you. Very cool stuff. Dallas is fun. Max says, I would love to go to Aquashella, but unless it, I'm over there, because you're in England, I believe, right? Lucky. Uh, nothing happening in the UK. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, I, I wish they would oh, could do you that. Imagine? They would, <gasps> I would, I would be go, the first one to sign like up. Imagine if there was an Aquashella, so they do not only the Cornwall. food that we're talking about, but we definitely we have to get one on the West Coast. There has to be one out there. I mean, we're missing no, that England. entire half of the country. England. We're also missing like the upper Northeast, so like the Boston area. Uh, that would be pretty cool. UK. Uh, I think Canada would be, I mean, I'm just talking local right now. Canada would be good. And then you branch out. Over the pond. Yep. Certainly. So I think we definitely need one in Switzerland. Switzerland, there might, Scotland. Yep. UK. Absolutely. Uh, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah. World tour. South Africa. Aquashella world tour. And India. And there's lots of um, aquarium stuff in India. Yeah. So I would, I think that's just go all over the place. I would, I would definitely try to go to every one. It'd but be yeah. awesome. We'd be gone like every month. Like, oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Right. I don't know if I can do Where this Where are we going again. now? You asked for it, pal. <laughs> yeah. Brian says Latvia. Sure. We'll do it. All right. Let's see here. Perry says, my daughter, who is six, watches each week when Jason comes on. She hugs the screen and says, the fish man. <laughs> That's awesome. Aww. Well, tell your daughter hello. Thanks for watching. Hello we appreciate from the fish it. Man. Hello from the fish man. Yep. Kind of like Aquaman. Aquaman, huh? Uh, uh, no. Sorry. No. Um, what was it? Barnacle Boy and Mermaid Man. Oh, Mermaid Man. I was like, Mermaid Man wow. and Barnacle Boy. Yep, That's right. Classic. See what it says. I'm hoping to make another Aquashella soon, but I'll definitely be at the Keystone Clash. Very cool. That'll work too. Nice. Noel says Aquashella Denver. I would like that quite a bit. I've said oh, that, that be, a number yeah. of times where if we yes. go out west, I'd, it would be nice if wherever we went, it was a location where, because there's a lot of families that go to Aquashella and there's got to be something to do. Obviously, the Aquashella is going to be the main thing, but there's got to be a, an infrastructure there where it's really got a strong family vibe. So people can bring their kids to other things too. I, that's one of the reasons why I really like the I idea of Daytona because you got the beach right there. Yeah, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, Hank says greetings from the Netherlands. Oh, very cool. I have a friend that lives in the Netherlands. My Instagram friend. Yep, and I get to hear. I love hearing like all about the different like economies and all the stuff that goes on in different places. It's really cool. Yeah, got Las Vegas. We got St. Louis. Oh yeah. <laughs> Got all the people in the world in the house. Karen Kay, do you know 
if they will be having a meet and greet Friday night at Aquashella in Daytona. I'm going and hmm. can't wait. I hope so. I'm, that has been at least the last three Aquashellas we've done that, and I hope they continue to do that. If it should, I would imagine it should be on the website by now in terms of if you get the VIP tickets, what's included in that. And I would be surprised if that information, if it's not already out, it should be pretty soon, but I hope so because that's a lot of fun. I like doing those on the Friday night before the thing starts. All right, Zen Ginger bought tickets to the Dallas Aquashella. Awesome. Oh, wait, in November of 2019, but come March 2020, the whole world kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, it shut down. Yeah, I know that was, Yeah. that whole thing got messed up. And then we were back in Florida, right? That was the first one back in 2020. Was it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure Florida was the first one that we came back to. It was so crazy. It was crazy awesome. And everybody was still trying to like figure out, like all, you could tell like all the vendors were like, all right, what's this going to be about? And it was so many people. It was cool. So yeah, glad it's back. Ned says, what is causing my cichlids to scratch against the sand and rock? Is it parasites? Uh, so it could be a lot of things. Again, I always go back to water, right? So we said that a few times. Check your ammonia, check your nitrite, make sure there's nothing there that could be irritating your fish at their, in terms of water parameters. Uh, for your cichlids, if they are African cichlids, make sure that they are uh, the water hardness is proper, your pH is high enough. And then if all of those things are okay, now some cichlids will just do that as a display of, of almost a territorial display where they will kind of do that. But often if they're flashing against stuff and they look irritated, it could be the beginning signs of ick usually. Right, that can and it can at first appear or not appear at all. It can it can develop in the gills and it kind of irritates them before you start seeing white spots. So keep an eye on it, especially if you've added any new fish recently. It does say YouTube meet and greet for the uh, Daytona. Good. So there, that answers your question. So it's probably going to be hopefully just like it always is on that Friday night before the Aquashella festivities begin on Saturday. Now where it's going it doesn't say where it's going to be, does it? No. They did it last time at a pet store, and I actually preferred the way they did it the first two times previous to that because it was a little quieter the first two times where it was at the pet store. There was a lot of pandemonium going on there, so it was a little harder to just kind of hang out. So we'll see. I think it just kind of depends on what's available, what space is available near where we're going to be. What's it says? This is my first live. I've only watched your YouTube videos. Well, I'm glad you're here. It's a fun time. There's a lot of really cool people in this chat. <laughs> it's a fun time. We have the funnest people. Yep. And Whip's thinking about going too. Uh, Whip says, are you going to the October Quad City Swap? Yes, that is the plan right now. To, I mean, that's not the plan right now. I've got our tables reserved. So yes, that's the plan is to go to the swap in Iowa. Quad Cities. That's a big one. That's the biggest swap that I've ever seen. I mean, to give you an idea, Greenwater typically, I don't know, maybe... Two to 400 people might walk through the door. GCCA, Greater Chicago Cichlid Association, somewhere between 500 and 800. It, it just depends. Before COVID, they were getting pretty close to 1,000. Quad City, I've only been there twice, but the two times we've been there, when they said there were, I think there were like 3,000 people there, I believe it. I mean, that place, it's a big place, and they're really efficient. And it doesn't cost people to get into Quad City. It doesn't cost people to get into the green water. GCCA, I think, is like five bucks or something. But it's there are thousands of people there, and there are so many vendors. It's huge. Like In terms of swaps, it's definitely the biggest one I've ever been a part of. It's very massive and very cool. If you go, The only thing you can't find at a Quad City swap, I think, for the most part, are people selling aquariums. But everything that could possibly go in an aquarium or around an aquarium, you can buy there. Dry goods wood plants rocks all kinds of different types of fish like fish related decorations and homemade handicrafts it there's a lot there it's very much worth going <laughs> whips world says hey it's my first live too how about that yes yes it is his sure first is, live today Whip. you bet yeah <laughs> it's his first live today <laughs> that is true <laughs> Second floor, I hope they do the Friday night meet and greet in Dallas 2024. That was so much fun at Aquashell 2022. I agree with you. I hope they do it too. 
Yeah. But that was the, yeah, and that was the one where I think we got to actually sit down and hang out. I like that. It's cool. All right, let me see here. I was scrolling, and then the thing jumped around and made me mess up my whole situation here, which is not what I wanted. Um, you got one or no? Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Bring it. Bring it. Michelle says, uh, why are my tanks so cloudy for hours after feedings? I feed North Fin Flakes in extreme one millimeter sinking pellets. I'm going to blame it on the extreme. So, um, <laughs> so that's a great question. So North Fin Flakes, extreme pellets. I, I think part of it is just making sure that regardless of the fish food, that it's all being eaten and it's not falling to the bottom and or and or the fish are not putting it in their mouth and then just kind of shredding it up. You'll see that sometimes with some cichlids. It's a little bit more obvious where they choo 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 like Oscars are notorious for this, at least mine were. They would just gobble up these pellets and then you'd just see a little pellet like sauce coming out of their gills just like spreading the stuff everywhere I'm like oh come on man they really are messy fish i love oscars they're one of my all-time favorites but my gosh so if you've got fish that are doing that that could potentially be why it gets a little cloudy but i mean we feed uh, we feed northland flakes to all our tanks and we don't have that issue in any of them so i don't think it's that Oh, Ross brings up a good point. Make sure your filter isn't full, definitely. Uh, meaning that your whatever media is in there, flaw, sponge, is not saturated with stuff. Because yeah. once it is, it just can't pull anything else out. So True. Um, that's why we, at least for our filter maintenance, we change out our filter floss every single week. If there's any sponges in the hang on back filters, they get rinsed out in tap water, cleaned out, and then that really helps for sure. Mark says, is it true at swaps that people just bring everything in bags? I've never been. That sounds interesting. That's what we do. That's what a lot of people do. So we back up our fish. So a typical swap, if it's on a Sunday at the Quad Cities, I think it starts at noon. We are up at 3 o'clock in the morning. We're bagging fish all morning. We're out of here by 8.30 or 9 o'clock, get there in time to do the setup. And then, yeah, most of them are in bags. Some vendors, they have fish tanks. And so they'll have some tanks where the fish are in there, but... Uh, and then they kind of break that down to bring it all home. But most people are bringing it in bags. And in my opinion, the swaps are by far, you know, comparing them to the pet stores, fish stores, there's not a comparison. I think the swaps are a much better place to go because usually you're saving a fair amount of money. Often you've got a lot of people who are breeding the fish themselves, and so you don't have to worry about nearly as many health issues. And then for, like in our case, even though we're not breeding a lot of the fish that we bring, we're quarantining them for four weeks, and there's really not many places that are doing that uh, if you're buying them from stores. All right, let me see here. Kenneth says, thanks so very much for your live stream and knowledge. You two present. Love your pleasant, sincere ways in which you two share your care of the fish hobby. Well, thank you. That's what we try to do. <laughs> uh, try to make it a pleasant place, otherwise... I don't know, there's so much abrasiveness in this world that we really need fish channels doing that too. I mean, that's just no. kind of how I look at it. It's supposed to be a nice fish hobby. It's supposed to be relaxing. Be it's supposed to be happy. It's supposed to bring yeah. you enjoyment. The last thing I would want to do is turn on a channel and just be like, have so like sad. controversy or stuff I'm angry. like that. Yeah. I'm constantly angry with my fish. I'm angry at the <laughs> hobby. I'm angry at imagine? everything. And you're like, well, man, I was just watching three other channels and they were all angry too. Is hmm. anybody not angry? My fish aren't angry. Yeah. Fish keepers are too cool for that. Yeah, I think that's generally true. Let's see here. Are Bolivian rams cheap, easy to keep, and able to keep alone in a 20-gallon? Yes to all of those. Bolivian rams tend to be less expensive than German blue rams, I think. Uh, I think they're easier, to, much easier to keep than German blue rams in terms of the allowable water parameters. They don't have to be kept so warm. Like the German blue rams, you really should be keeping those fish at 82, 83, 84 like pretty close to almost discus temperatures and they really appreciate soft water with a low pH where the Bolivian rams, we've kept them in our water parameters many times. We've bred them in our water parameters. They live a super long time. And by the way, our water parameters are closer to a pH of eight to 8.2, GH and KH of 10 and temperatures around 78 to 80. And they are awesome. 
Not as colorful, all right? So I will grant you that, that they are not as colorful, colorful as the German Blue Rams or their electric blues and electric yellows and stuff, but still really cool. Mac, thank you so much for gifting the Primetime Aquatics memberships. Aww. And because of that, got Patty, Michelle, and Rhonda, and Ben, and Lisa's Tank are now prime timers because of Mac. Thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. That's really cool. Very cool. And all says, Bolivian Rams are my absolute favorites. So beautiful and wonderful to watch. Fabulous personalities, and all of mine have been very hardy. I agree with you. I love the Bolivian Rams. It's awesome fish. They are. Oh, all right. So second floor asks a good question. Is there a difference in whether the chat highlights the name, the at name, um, for us or whoever, if people type prime, w prime time aquatics with spaces or without spaces? Probably right. Doesn't it have to well, be exactly as I'll how tell it's you listed? This, for at least when you just did that, it highlighted it in both ways for for us. So I see did that it? at prime time aquatics oh. with spaces, and then also without it's both highlighted. Either so or. So I don't think it matters. I didn't know that. I always assumed that it had to be exact. Thanks, second floor for that experiment that you just did. It uh, we learned something. Excellent. Zen says I have two preteen girls. I reserve the right mm. to be angry, but never <laughs> at the fishes. <laughs> I could understand that. I, I, I mean, I empathize. <laughs> so I, I can't really relate because I have two boys, but they're not a picnic either sometimes. You know, the teenage years is kind of like uh, I had um, my sister had a friend who would always say her son was a handful in high school, and she would always say, You know what? I love you, but I just don't like you very much right now. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I've been on record a million times, probably a million and three times, saying that. As kids get older, they get easier to be around. And I said that because generally speaking, once they, it's like everything they did, it's like, okay, I don't have to change diapers anymore. Awesome. Now they're walking, so I don't have to carry them anymore. Awesome. Now they are somewhat self-sufficient. I don't have to watch them like a hawk as much. Cool. Oh, now they're able to clean the house, do some laundry, do some chores, <laughs> even better. I shouldn't. I've jumped the gun on that one because then they get to a point where they have their own independence yep. and want to express that. And now you're like, okay, now the <laughs> fun starts. Now I understand what everybody's talking about. It's like a circle. Yeah, yeah, it is. Keith, thank you so much for the super chat. What were your best and worst experiences buying fish online? Well, that's a great question because I actually don't buy a lot of fish online. So, uh, Obviously, the worst experiences are when you buy fish and they're all dead, right? So I've had that happen. Um, I'm, I'm not going to – the place where I bought them from is not a channel sponsor or anything like that. But And this was going back years where I ordered some fish and one of the bags basically showed up nearly dead, put them in the tank, and we wound up with one red spot gold severum that lived. It is the same red spot gold severum that we currently have in our 75 gallon. But I ordered six of them and that was the one. And, and he had a, a wife for a, a long time, right? That was a pair that we had in the 40. So I had two yeah. and then he's the last one. But that obviously that's that's a bad experience. So when that happens, it's not cool. Um, um, from uh, keepfishkeeping.com, Lisa. And John over at KG Tropicals, we did get a bet off from them. Yep, that was cool. Beautifully packaged. Um, Flip Aquatics, they are a channel sponsor, Flip Aquatics, and they have sent us, I don't know how many fish, but a lot. Oh, that's true. And it's, it's they 100% mm -hmm. of the time, I've never had to go back to Rob and be like, hey, dude, this stuff is uh, not looking so good. They're so pros. that's always been great. Uh, and it's one of those things where ordering online, if you're ordering from, let's say, like an Aquabit or someone who doesn't have like a big company standing behind them, you are taking a chance sometimes, right? But maybe they've got fish you absolutely cannot find anywhere else. And so you take a chance and you learn, right? Sometimes it works out pretty well. Sometimes it doesn't. But anytime you're shipping fish, you introduce risk. That's right. That, that's the difference between going to someplace local. Someplace local, you're going to their, their place. You're looking at the fish. You're picking those fish out. You're transporting them for a very short period of time, right? Now, all of, most of those fish had to be shipped from somewhere. So it's not like they were never shipped ever. You know, it's not like the pet stores are just breeding all the fish that they sell. So, yeah, I mean, you find places that you can trust. Again, that's why we partner with Flip Aquatics because 
I have to feel comfortable that when they run their business and they're shipping shrimp and they're shipping fish and all these goods, that you guys who receive that stuff feel good about the transaction because what good does it do me to partner with a company and then you have an experience with that company and it's horrible and then you're like, wow, your credibility is garbage because you told me this was gonna be good and all I've had were bad experiences. That serves nobody well, so uh, yeah. But just do your research, be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Are you looking at the Pibble Punk, the ordinary mammal? Thank you what so much name. for the super chat. Appreciate it. Found a free 10 gallon out by the dumpster and Score. took the opportunity. Oh, yeah. I mean, you got to try it out. Yeah. Right? Intend to make a planted tank for a bed. I love your channel. I've learned Aww. a lot. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad you're here. Yeah. I mean, that's like a, I still get excited, even though I have no, I'm downsizing. We're getting rid of tanks, but every time. Like garbage day rolls around, you're just driving around on the way to work. You're like, what is that? Someone's taking and throwing away a tank, and there's always a part of me, even if it's like a 20 gallon, I'm like, <laughs> slam on the brakes. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm, tr- I'm selling like eight 20 gallons right now, trying to get rid of these things. What am I going to do with this one that I pick up on the oh side of the road? Gosh. So, but I will say, if, I mean, if it was a large tank, like a six foot tank, I'll figure out a way to get it in the back of my yeah, truck. You would. I'll do, I don't care if it's like 300 gallons. I will pick that thing up and figure out a way, use leverage to get that bad boy in my in my truck. No doubt. Yeah. So that's exciting. Hopefully it works out wonderfully for you and it's an awesome planted tank. Just make sure that it holds water. And <laughs> pro tip for you, if you ever do pick up an aquarium from the side of the road or a dumpster, test whether or not it holds water outside of your house. Because... It's not doing its job. You don't want to find that out on your kitchen counter, on the floor of your basement, or your living room. Be like, oh, yeah, wow, that's unfortunate. The thing was leaking. That's why it's by the dumpster or on the side of the road. But most of the time, I have found that people just don't want the aquariums. Yeah, they and they, just... you know, they don't want to bother selling them because maybe it's just a, what are you going to do? Are you going to put a 20-gallon on, on the Internet for sale for 10 bucks, and you got to have someone come over and pick it up. So it's like just it's going on the side of the road. Um, David, hi David. Uh, I was told that I can have two Oscars and a seventy-five. So I tell you what I would do with the Oscars. I originally had some Oscars, the small ones. They, I, you know, you get them from the pet store. They're so cute. They got the big eyes. They're goofy looking. They look like little babies, but they were small. They were maybe an inch and a half, two inches. I mean, really small. So I threw three of them in a fifty-five gallon, which is the same length, close to the same height as a seventy-five. Obviously, it's more narrow. Those fish outgrew that 55 within, I don't remember, four months. I mean, they Oscars grow really, really fast. And now my plan was not to keep them in there. I had to get the 125s up and running so I could transfer them, and I did. And you could make an argument. I had three of them in the 125, and they were pretty big at one point. That, That was pushing the lower limits, in my opinion. So the moral of the story is, I have seen Oscars that were every bit 13 or 14 inches long, but Oscars are also wide-bodied and they're relatively tall fish, extremely messy and voracious eaters. So I personally wouldn't keep them in a 75 gallon. I would want at least a six foot tank to give them some space. The other thing too is if you wound up with two Oscars and they were both males in a 75, I that might not work long-term. And so I, I like the six foot tank, at least a 125 for a couple of Oscars. All right, let's see here. We'll do a couple more and then we'll uh, start wrapping it up. All right, let's see. A lot of people say it's it's platform specific, whether or not you can put a person's name with spaces or without, exact oh, or not. Could be. So yeah. I'm I'm looking at a phone. So somebody type in the small scape, no spaces and spaces, and let me see what's highlighted. Uh, so we're still doing experiments. Testing, okay. testing. All right. Cool. We're doing some tests, and you're part of it. You are part of our knowledge. Little Midwest Reborns in Dolls. Oh, hi, Gina. It's oh, Gina. It's Gina. Okay. It's Gina. I'm buying my new fish from Flip Aquatics. Awesome. I hope you have a great experience. <gasps> Tell them we said I was yeah. up. I hope you have a wonderful experience. They uh, should be sending us some what stuff are you pretty soon. Share with the class, Gina. What are you yeah. getting? Or maybe it's a top secret, right? It could be. If it's a secret, yeah. then don't tell us. Whip says, I have one in my one, in my 210 and it looks oh. cramped. Yeah, and a two ten, Whip, your 210, is that a, I'm assuming that's a six foot tank, six by 24 by whatever that is, close to uh, 28 inches, 27, somewhere in there, right? Yeah. All right, so test is complete. I only see it with a box on it if there's spaces in between. 
So when the Zen did it? Yeah. In second floor, but not when Mac. Correct. Oh, okay. Well, how about Correct. that? But that's also the way that, that you have your, your YouTube channel. So if you didn't, mm -hmm. if you for some reason had it all smushed together, mm -hmm. then maybe it would work out the other way. Yeah. Nice job, everybody. We're figuring Thanks. things out. <laughs> how cool <laughs> is that? Wait, I saw something. Whip said, yeah, he might be 15 inches. I believe it. I mean, they, those fish get and get... I know a lot of times on the internet, it's like, oh, they get about a foot. Well, give them a large enough space and enough food and enough time, they can get even bigger. Ooh, wait, you didn't get this one yet. Did you stacking with, uh, uh, from Mike, suggestions no. for a 10-gallon heavily planted CO2 tank uh, with a ton of cherry shrimp. Still have no mm -hmm. fish and want to add some. Looking for ideas. <gasps> all right, so I know what I, so cherry red. shrimp, right? Yeah, so then you've got the dwarfs. All right, rasboras, dwarf rasbora, or the miras, or the chilies, mm -hmm. and I in a ten gallon heavily planted, easily fifteen. Yeah, and it'd look awesome, and, and your your shrimp would be safe. What about green green kubatai's too? I uh, probably, they're but pretty small. they are pretty small. But I wonder if they would take advantage of maybe some of the shrimplets because they get a little bit bigger than those rasboras. Probably not enough to notice, mm -hmm. but yeah, that would be an option. That could be an option too. Uh, let me see. Nick says, thoughts on a community fish I could add to a 29-gallon looking for something blue. Love your channel. Love the channel. You guys rock and are what got me into fish keeping. Well, thanks for being here. So 29-gallon, huh? You want blue. You want to add blue fish? I'll give you blue fish. So, and by the way, we do have a video on blue fish. And I think we kind of organized it by size. So check out. I'll just type a blue fish primetime aquatics and it will come up. So... You've got the blue neon rasbora. You've got the standard neon. You've got the cardinal tetra. I would say green neon because they are kind of blue. But they not they as can blue look as the other blue, ones. green, or purple, no, and I they wouldn't. are the world's best fish. I'm just Don't gonna, do the green neon if you're looking for blue, blue, though. I'm just throwing uh, that out there. You have, in a 29 gallon, depending on how the other fish are, you've got the, the um, dwarf gourami, so the powder blue. Yes, uh, that you can't would go look pretty cool. There's a couple different blue dwarf right. gouramis that could work in a tank like that. Uh, what other blue fish? What do you guys? Ram. Uh, ram. Yeah, the electric blue ram in a 29 gallon could certainly be something. Again, just check and make sure that your water parameters are correct for the fish that we're mentioning because we're just throwing out blue fish right now. Rice fish? Yeah, I don't know. They're, I don't think they're blue enough. I mean, oh. if you really want strong blue. Yeah, axle rod eyes. Thank you, yeah, Zen. Yeah, that was yeah. axle rod eye is the go. neon blue raspberry. There you Thanks. go. Ding, um, ding, ding. We have a winner. Is there anything else that we could, in a 29-gallon, that we can suggest? <laughs> Green hearts. Green hearts yeah. for me. Blue Angel Ross in a 29. Yeah, you might be able to put one. Yeah, you could put one in a 29 for a while until it gets really, really big. Uh, but they're not, well, they, I mean, they can get somewhat blue. They can get pretty blue. But, yeah, those are some options, I think. You, you've got some, some things to work with there. All right, everybody. I think it's probably time to call it an evening because it's getting late and uh, I'm sure all of you are very tired and then we have to the, around here we got to deal with another 100 degree day yeah tomorrow it's that's going to be fun but anyway thank you so much for for hanging out with us tonight thank you for all the super chats and for all the questions and for Mac donating all those memberships and everything like that and for our moderators hanging out with us and all that stuff. Thank you so much. We'll be back. We will be back next Wednesday, same time, same place. If you have questions, write them down. Bring them to us next week. Really appreciate it. And we will see you next week. Have a good weekend. Go Astros.